In this episode, Professor Emeritus of Biological Sciences, Dr. Gail Mishner, delivers a talk entitled, Love Them, Despise Them, Study Them, Perspectives on an Iconic Prairie Animal, and answers the questions that you never thought you would ask about Richardson's ground squirrels. Named in 1822 to honor Arctic explorer and British naval officer Sir John Richardson, Richardson's ground squirrels are expensive exotic pets for some, detested agricultural pests for others, and fascinating research subjects for a few. Matt is leaving the room, so farewell. <laughs> that leaves me here with a audi live audience in front of me of one. I was given permission to bring a member of my bubble. My little bubble has only got two people in it, myself and my husband, Dan. Um, it's entirely appropriate that Dan be here because the last 26 years of research data that I collected in the field, I collected uh, on a piece of grassland uh, that is within Dan's pedigreed seed farm. And so this is a happy instance of a farmer and a zoologist having careers side by side uh, and uh, in, in harmony. So here I am with one person in the room that I can see and then an unknown number of you basically that I can't see out there. Uh, and so this is a very odd situation to be in. And despite all this wonderful technology we have, we discovered that the pointer does not show on this screen. Fortunately, we happen to have my walking stick in the car, and so my walking stick is going to be my pointer for this presentation. So, this iconic species. Chances are the majority of you, especially if you've grown up on the prairies, are going to end, call these animals gophers. So that's a very common name for them. And they have several perspectives, or we have several perspectives of them, in terms of do we have a positive view of them or do we have a negative view of them? And then there are other perspectives that we can have as well, and the one that uh, I had for my life was to actually study them. And when I study them and uh, present results, you'll notice that I call them Richardson's Ground School. So all of these publications use the commonly accepted common name of this species, Richardson's Ground School. This, of course, results in terminological confusion when some people call them gophers and some people call them Richardson's ground squirrels. So, channeling the great British bard and asking, wherefore art thou, Richardson's ground squirrel? Would you be a sweet by any other name? So I'm going to decompose the name or de, uh, the portions of this name here in terms of what do they mean and what we think about them. If I say what's a squirrel, or I ask you to conjure up in your mind what a squirrel is, or especially ask a child, how do they know that something's a squirrel? Chances are the thing they're going to point out is that they have big bushy tails that they're able to roll over their back. But if they're described that way, it actually means that what you're talking about is a tree squirrel, something that needs a big bushy tail for balance running around on the branches. Generally, we don't attach an adjective to squirrel in this sort of situation, and so squirrel without an adjective typically means an arboreal species. It turns out that here in Alberta, and in fact in the prairies in general, there are very few species of tree squirrels. There are only two species of tree-dwelling squirrels in Alberta, but there are 11 ground-dwelling species. So in fact, there are far more species of squirrels living on the ground than uh, in trees. We divide them up into groups according to their size. So the small ones we refer to as chipmunks, the really large ones we refer to as marmots, and then in between we have these intermediate size, the ground squirrel, and then slightly larger and chunkier, the prairie dog. And I want to particularly draw your attention to the tail on the prairie dog. Notice that it's relatively short to the size of the animal and has a distinct black tip to it. So how many of these do we have in Alberta? Uh, there are three species of chipmunks in the mountains. There's five species of ground squirrels distributed from the prairies and into the mountains and into central Alberta. We do not have any prairie dogs in Alberta. Uh, if you want to see a prairie dog in Canada, the only place to go is Grasslands National Park and that area around there. And we have three species of marmots in Alberta. So it's an extremely rich fauna of ground-dwelling squirrels. So as a consequence, what we learn from the name is squirrel is telling us something about 
basically the inheritance of these animals, who they're closely related to, what defines a squirrel is actually based on uh, cranial and dental characteristics primarily. Uh, not bushy tails or lack of bushy tail, that does not define a squirrel. Ground, of course, is telling you something about where they live. And then Richardson's is telling you which particular species of ground squirrel, the five we have in Alberta, that it is. And that, of course, raises the question of who is the Richardson after whom these animals are named. Well, John Richardson was an Arctic explorer and a British naval officer. And he had two duties as a naval officer, which was he was a physician by training, so keeping sailors healthy. But as was common in those days, physicians were also people who had very good general knowledge of uh, uh, plant life, animal life in their area. So what happened, if you cast your mind back for exploring for the Northwest Passage, parts of the Arctic coast was known on the west, parts of the Arctic coast were being discovered on the east, but continued there were problems getting more into the center of the Arctic because of the uh, permanent sea ice that existed often year after year. So the British naval officers saw that a, a sensible way to approach this problem was to do overland expeditions. So the first two Franklin expeditions, on which Richardson was second in yeah. command, sailed into Hudson's Bay, and then they would use the river systems, portaging between ones flowing in different directions to get to the Coppermine River, realizing that it flowed into the Arctic Ocean. So if you went up the Coppermine, then you would get to the coast, and then you could start doing some mapping of the coastline in this area. And so that's exactly what happened on the first Franklin Overland uh, Expedition. In the winter of 1819-1820, uh, then, uh, they had to overwinter Fort Carlton in what is now Saskatchewan. And while they were waiting for the rivers to thaw out in the spring, Richardson went out collecting specimens. And those specimens were packaged up and sent back to the British Museum. And several years later then, uh, they were named in Richardson's honor. It's really totally amazing that this naval officer's name is attached to a prairie species, because even where he overwintered in 1819-20 was only just in, within reach of what is but basically the northern extreme of Richardson's ground schools. So this is really quite a remarkable naming. Uh, amongst the other material that Richardson sent back was another species of ground squirrel that was named uh, after Franklin. So we have a Richardson's ground squirrel and Franklin ground squirrel, and those specimens were collected then on this overland trip. Since Richardson didn't go on the third Franklin expedition, luckily for him, he lived a long and uh, well-recognized life much of his career spent doing his job as a surgeon or physician. So the, this squirrel was named in Richardson's honor then by a scientist who worked in the British Museum, and that name was assigned in 1822. So it's a name with almost 200 years old, and it is the name that we should be using to refer to this animal, Richardson's ground squirrel. So why don't we, in fact, call them gophers? Is there something wrong with the name gopher that we say, well, the correct name of this animal is a Richardson's ground squirrel? Well, the problem with gopher is that it belongs to other animals. It's already a name that's taken. And so if you look up a book like this, it gives you the common names, that is, the everyday names of the 5,000 or so mammals of the world. You look under G for gopher, it'll immediately set you to another part of the index for pocket gopher, and then you'll discover there's lots of different species of pocket gophers. If you want to find where Richardson's ground squirrel is, you've got to go to the S section and look for squirrels. Under that, get to the subsection for ground squirrels. Under that, keep looking down the list until you find the Richardson's ground squirrel. So they are true squirrels and not closely related to pocket gophers uh, at all. So let's compare the two so that we can settle uh, in agreement on what is a gopher and what is a ground squirrel and what is a mole, because there's an, another level of confusion here. So ground squirrels are members of the squirrel family, and the, 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 they are obligate hibernators, so that means you don't see them in the wintertime. But when they're active, they forage above ground during the daytime, so they're readily visible during their active season. Uh, because they're active daytime, and then they 
build tunnel systems, complex tunnel systems to create their underground homes. But you can always figure out where those uh, areas are because they always leave a hole, an entrance exit, uh, in the mounds that they kick up to the surface. In Alberta, we have one species of pocket gopher, sometimes called a mole, just to add further terminological confusion uh, in the world. Uh, they do not hibernate, the moles, the pocket gophers remain active year-round. They forage below ground because they're root eaters, so the food that they find is underground. On the rare occasions they come above ground, um, they're nocturnal, so in the night time. So they're very, very rarely seen by people. And the mounds that they do create sometimes as they kick out unwanted soil to the surface, that will happen at night and they cover up the hole and go back underground so there's no evidence of where they've gone in and out of this mound of soil. So they're really very different animals. It's just unfortunate that we have a true gopher in Alberta, uh, well the prairies in general, uh, but uh, we've borrowed that name gopher to refer to the ground squirrel. So it's understandable people get confused, but what I hope that you will take away from this is that uh, Ground squirrels are the, is the correct name of these animals, uh, and they are truly a type of squirrel. I just wanted to point out that in all this technological equipment that we have set up here, we discovered that a laser pointer would not show up on the screen. Fortunately, I happen to have my hiking stick in the car, so that's why I'm using a hiking stick. It's not to prevent me from falling over it, so I can use it as a pointer on this screen. So. Richardson's ground squirrels end up having basically three names, if you like. There's their fancy Latinized name, Eurocitellus richardsonii, um, which is their official designation. Then we have an English common name for them, which is Richardson's ground squirrel. And then we have their everyday vernacular name, usually just gopher, but people who realize that there are five species of gophers in Alberta. There's uh, the Colombian ground squirrel in the mountains, the golden mantle ground squirrel, the 13 line ground squirrel, and uh, the, what have I still got, Franklin's ground squirrel, and then the Richardson's ground squirrel. So if you want to distinguish between the different types of quotes gophers, then prairie gopher is the one that would refer to this particular species. So going back to the different perspectives that people might have of ground squirrels, the most common one, I think, is an understanding that these are pests in agricultural communities. And so that's a negative view. Uh, the only good gopher is a dead go gopher. People are concerned about the numbers of them, uh, take all sorts of steps to try and reduce their numbers. But we do see positive uses here. Uh, Gainer the gopher is the mascot of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And so its job is to rally the fans and get them cheering for their team. So a totally different perspective. If we pursue the one about the, the gopher being a uh, vermin and a pest, something that should be gotten rid of, a remarkable example where we see of this is a, uh, a gopher derby that was uh, held in 2002. And the idea here was that you, for a certain amount of money, you signed up to be an entrant, and then you would turn in the tails of the squirrels that you killed shoot, presumably, would be the most common way. So it was, in a sense, a competition, but it had multiple senses in a way, because at the very bottom of this rather large, fancy poster that was put out, it says, have fun and help landowners with their gopher problem. So this is an interesting notion. The idea is to go out and kill as many animals as you can and have fun while doing it. So that's one perspective, then, of what's happening and having fun seems like a version of entertainment. So going out and killing animals, cutting off their tails and here you can see the sort of result there was. People turned in tails as evidence that they had killed an animal. This is mimicking what happened in the early settlement days when agriculture was getting going on the prairies where there was a bounty in fact on, on ground squirrels, gophers as they would have been called and people had to turn in their tails uh, for something like a cent a piece, maybe sometimes two cents a piece, depending on where and the time. And that was very much so during the 1920s, 1930s, that there was a bounty on these animals. 
And the bounty was seen as serving several purposes, one of which was to encourage people to kill ground squirrels because they were competing with the agricultural uh, roles. Uh, but also it was a little source of income, especially for the kids, that they would get a penny apiece for every tail they turned in. So it added also to the financial uh, stability of the, of the farming community. The reason that the ground squirrels are viewed so negatively has to do, of course, with the origin of how agriculture started in the prairies. Uh, people came in and settled, broke the prairie up, in doing so removed the food source of these animals that were living in the ground. Plowing the ground didn't have a big effect on the burrow systems because it would be shallow and so most of the tunnels and chambers underground were still there. So the animals had their home, but they didn't have any food except, of course, for what the agricultural people, the farmers, planted. So it was a case of humans placing themselves very much in conflict with the residents, uh, animals there. And so if you go into the literature of the time, anything that covers what life was like in the early 1900s, almost inevitably there will be some reference uh, to uh, ground squirrels. So in Wallace Stegner's book, The Wolf Willow, for example, he talks about how they use traps and, and uh, 22s, guns and strychnine, all techniques that are still used today in order to try and reduce the numbers of ground squirrels. And Wallace and his brother collected more gopher tails than anyone else in southern Saskatchewan, and so they were very proud of what they had done in helping the family farming situation. But reflecting on what he had done in, the in 1915 as a young boy, decades later when he wrote Wolf Willow, he realized that, in fact, they were participating in what you could view as savagery and slaughter at the time, not fully appreciating the impact and meaning of what they were doing. I was surprised to discover as I was scanning around the internet the other day that there are still places that actually do have a bounty. Well, maybe they don't call it a bounty, but the rural uh, municipality of Stanley, which is in uh, southern Manitoba, uh, this year held what they called a gopher program uh, and uh, are paying out a dollar per tail uh, for tails that are turned in in that area. I should mention that in terms of the gopher derby that was held in 2002, in fact, maybe I'll go back to, to that slide. Uh, and point out that 61,107 ground squirrel tails were turned in. The person who got the big prize uh, was responsible for uh, about 10% of that, 6,200 and some tails. So they were really huge numbers. Of course, in addition to viewing this as a form of entertainment, there was a justification given for doing this in terms of reducing the number of ground squirrels in the population. But 2002 is a very different world from when what uh, Wallace Stegner is talking about in 1915. We're now talking about a culture in which most, most people, people live in cities or towns. Relatively, relatively few, few people, people are still, still living out on, on, on farms. farms. Farms have become, become big commercial, commercial uh, operations, operations to a large extent. extent. And, and so, so the, the people, people who were involved in this shooting were probably largely removed from the agricultural world, world but, but viewed that they, they had permission to do so justifying it by saying, well, I'm helping out the farmers by killing off the gophers. So if you consult the newspapers, the media, typically still taking a rather negative attitude, taking aim at them, they're a scourge, better ways to try and kill them, and then getting rid of them by strychnine. The strychnine story, however, will be coming to an end. It is uh, banned as of this year, banned as a way of killing ground squirrels. But there is a, a period of time of about three years uh, to use up existing supplies that are in the, in the communities and in the stores. But as of uh, 2023, um, strychnine cannot be used to kill Richardson's ground squirrels. So, coming back to some other perspectives, that's, you know, the reviled pest part of the story. What about something a little different? Using a ground squirrel, gopher, as the mascot for your team, so the Saskatchewan uh, Rough Riders. And so again, the gopher, they recognize exactly Richardson's ground squirrels. Ten out of ten for these people. They know that 
Gophers really are actually a type of squirrel that lives on the ground. And so again, the gopher then is uh, very popular uh, and the mascot. There's some interesting things I find when I look at Gain of the Gopher. First of all, he wears a jersey. Recently, it got to be the number 13 jersey, then changed the number on it. But he doesn't actually have any underpants on. And if you look more closely, in fact, he doesn't even seem to have any genitalia. So this is kind of an interesting notion, a, a kind of a sexless animal. The name Gaina is actually an anagram of Regina. It's just using the same letters and mixing them up. And so I think it's kind of fascinating. Just something to think about is Regina is a female monarch, queen. And if you mix up the letters, you get Gaina. What sex is something called Gaina going to be when it derives from the word Regina? Well, of course, because it's a mascot for a men's uh, football team, uh, we know that Gaina is, in fact, a male, though you can't actually tell that from looking at him. Other ways that we see the gopher represented in prairie societies, Eston in Saskatchewan has a 2.4 meter high gopher. Uh, this was uh, carved uh, by a local Eston resident uh, from a particular sort of stone, so we have a ma magnificent mascot for the town here, big enough that they hope people will go out of the way to visit Eston so they can see the biggest gopher in the world. So tourism, attracting people to come to your town by using this symbol and encouraging people to, to visit. Uh, the town of Webb in southern Saskatchewan for a number of years had an interpretive wildlife center. The interpretive function has now been moved to Grasslands National Park. Uh, but they had a wonderful uh, poster, didn't name what the animal was, but it's clearly a, what I would call a Richardson's ground squirrel. Nice little comparison here as to how accurately the, the sculptor has worked on the stone here. A little bit of misrepresentation of how the head goes, but nonetheless, everyone's going to know what that is. And that stance that we see both there and there actually does account for some, uh, another common name that is used in some regional areas. Sometimes these gophers are called picket pins, reflecting the fact that they stand up so straight, uh, much like a pin in a bowling alley. So there are additional vernacular names uh, in addition to gopher for these animals. Oftentimes, gopher appears in a place name. And so, for example, we have Gopher Hill Paintball. So this is basically a, a local entertainment in the Lloyd Minster area and they have borrowed the gopher, and they've done a cartoon version of a gopher. Personally, I'd be kind of hard-pressed to recognize that it really was a gopher. It's the name that tells us that this thing is actually uh, a gopher. And then uh, in Manitoba, uh, Gopher Creek near Burden, Manitoba, using the name for uh, a restaurant. Sadly, they didn't include, I thought it would have been cute if they had included in their cup of coffee symbol uh, uh, a little recognition of uh, a gopher. But they chose not to do that, but we have the name represented. And what about Alberta? Modern Alberta is named after gophers. Well, for a number of years, the Big Rock Brewery brewed gopher lager. And so they had these uh, uh, advertising signs uh, which were in the fields of the, some of the farmers who were actually growing the grains that went in to make uh, the gopher lager. And then most famous of all is the Gopher Hole Museum in, in Alberta. And when you think about a museum and you're going to go to a museum, what do you anticipate? Generally, a museum is characterized by having a curated exhibition uh, of whatever it might be, depending on whether it's a historical museum or a natural history museum or an art museum, but curated ex exhibits with informative information alongside. So does this apply to the Gopher Hole Museum? Well, it's a really rather remarkable museum, and it doesn't really fit the classic uh, description of what purpose of a museum is. When you walk in, it's basically a single room and the Gopher Hole Museum. When you walk in there, what you see is a whole series of dioramas, about 30 of them in total, covering the three walls. 
This is a child-friendly place. They've got little step stools here so the kids can stand up and look at the different dioramas. They're each relatively small, about the size of a small aquarium. And if you look carefully at what they're, uh, what's going on in each diorama, you see that there are scenes of life in and around the town of Torrington. Some in the past, the train station maybe doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. Some current of businesses that are currently there. And this is, if you start looking more closely at each of these, they are really rather remarkable little dioramas. The characters in them are gophers that have been stuffed. They're mounts, as you might find in a natural history museum. But they have been dressed up in little miniature human clothes. And so here we have a pair of these animals, perhaps pretend people, at the local diner. Here's the female. She's got a little pearl necklace. We know this is the boy because he's got a cravat on. And he is saying, oh boy, am I ever stuffed. And of course, that's a wonderful play on words because he is a stuffed animal and having eaten too much dinner, he is stuffed in the other sense of the word. Another one, and there are so many of these, I'd love to show them all, but I'm only going to show these two. The other wonderful one shows a town father in the best of clothes and a hippie here, recognizable by the beard and the beads. And they are arguing over the fate of this particular uh, gopher here. That's a 13-lined brown squirrel, commonly known as a striped gopher. And so the town father is saying we need it for the museum, and the hippie here is trying to save it. And it's a protest, and a protest by a group called Gags, gophers against getting stuff. So again, a wonderful play on words of the notion of these animals in the museum, in fact, being stuffed specimens. Uh, and uh, arguing that they uh, would be against getting stuffed. So, what are the functions of the Torrington Gopher Hall Museum? Well, Torrington is just far enough off the highway that runs from Calgary to Red Deer to not really be on the tourist trail. And so, back in the 19, uh, 1990s, the government of Alberta was in fact making small grants available to towns that needed to uh, cope with the fact that there were uh, little towns were shrinking, having difficult times, and it would be useful if they could attract tourism to the town and support the economy that way. So tourism and entertainment really are the main functions of these dioramas. There is no information, or essentially no information, about the organisms themselves. This is a depiction of town and country life in Torrington, past and present. And so it's up to the viewers as they look at these little dioramas to work out what the meaning of all of this is, rather than that you get a life story of what goes on in a Richardson's Ground Sports life. So back to the bard again, what's in a name? You can ask the question, we see the use of gopher all the time. Does the term ground school get used very often? Well, it turns out that yes. In the pet trade, in the pet trade, they are uh, called ground squirrels. And they are quite expensive pets. They are exotic pets outside their geographic range. A person in the geographic range would consider it absurd to turn a, uh, a gopher into a pet. But if you call it a Richardson's ground squirrel in some other part of the world, then it's an exotic pet. Uh, this particular company, Even Kill Exotics, in, located in Michigan, last year was selling them for 150 US dollars a piece. Now, if you think about those 61,000 tails that were turned in in the 2002 Gopher Derby, if you had gotten $150 per tail, that would add up to about $9 million. But of course, there's uh, the sort of animals that are going to go into the pet trade are very different uh, in the way they're reared and uh, made available to people uh, than going out and shooting gophers in the field. Uh, here's another site that has them for $125 a piece. So these are two US pet stores, so they are sometimes considered exotic pests within North America. Uh, they are especially uh, very exotic pets in Europe. There are no ground squirrels uh, in most of Europe. They are only found in the very southeast of Europe. And so they sell for substantial amounts of money, hundreds of euros, hundreds of pounds sterling, 
uh, to have one of these animals as a pet. This is a Spanish website put up by an owner of two of these uh, Richardson's ground squirrels. Here, Alia Richardsoni, I here. Uh, I was just I just received this photograph very recently from uh, a contact in Lithuania uh, about his pet. Uh, and you can see here that the animal's been dead a long time, but he writes very eloquently about how wonderful this animal was as a pet and how he wished he could find another one to, to have uh, because this one was such a special friend. So there is, a, there is a different perspective altogether, a pest or pet, and here we have the people who view these as pets. So. Moving along to other representations that actually recognize that there are ground squirrels, this is a very lovely little, mostly photographed book uh, by Lang and Lynch, based in Calgary, uh, on the Richardson's ground squirrel, part of their baby animal series. Uh, so here, using ground squirrel. Here's another children's book here, uh, A Gopher Tail, playing on the concept of tail, something that gets cut off for a bounty, but in this case, of course, using uh, the other spelling of it. And although the title is Go for Tail, the book itself clearly recognizes that it's about Richardson's ground squirrel. And it's quite a cute little story about a bad dream that a ground squirrel has. Of course, the ultimate recognition of, of being something worth having is to be turned into a stuffed toy. And over the years, various people have given me things, or sometimes I've found them in stores. And you might think that these are Richardson's ground schools, but if you think carefully back to what I told you about prairie dogs, if you turn these stuffed animals around and look at them, they all have short tails with black tips to them. They are, in fact, black-tailed prairie dogs. And so I have never actually managed to come up with a stuffed toy that is truly representing a Richardson's ground school, a prairie gopher. So if any of you know of any, do tell me about it, because I'd be interested to see them. So let's take the other perspective. We've seen these animals being despised as pests that should be destroyed. We've seen them being used in amusing ways to indicate entertainment and tourism. But then there's the study them uh, aspect. And that's what I spent my, much of my professional career studying Richardson's ground schools. When I first came from Australia to Canada, I was completely amazed by these animals. There's nothing equivalent to them in Australia. Uh, there are various Australian mammals, but they tend to be nocturnal because Australia is a hot country. And so there, there are no squirrels of any description, even tree squirrels in Australia. So when I came out to the prairies, I was en uh, enraptured by these animals that live on the ground, have an underground home that they can go down and up from. Uh, and I was interested in what sort of maternal behavior they might have. In retrospect, it was kind of an odd topic to have chosen because the young are born underground and typically spend the first month of life underground. Here we see females moving their litter for one reason or another. This is a newborn Richardson's grounds for probably no more than about 24, days, uh, 24 hours old. And for some reason, the female has decided to move her litter. They can only move one at a time, so it's a bit of a slow process. It does make them a bit vulnerable. So they, they only do this if there's a good reason. If there's danger, maybe a weasel or a badger around, they're trying to move the young to a better location, or perhaps just because the nest has become fouled up. Here we have a mother with young that are not quite ready to be independent. This one, I would say, is probably about 26 or 27 days old, and literally quite a mouthful for her to cover. And so she has to trip along trying to carry this young uh, to a new location uh, to give them a, a better home. Um, I did eventually get quite a lot of information on kinship, but that's not particularly what I'm going to focus on now. There are many, many aspects of what I studied, and I have needed to look at one particular aspect to focus on for the purpose of this presentation. So one of the things I realized fairly quickly is if you want to understand anything about these animals, you need to be able to track them throughout their lifetimes. And so if you have a group like this, three young ground schools, they would be about five weeks old, between four and a half and five weeks old. And you want to know, well, if they survive to reach the stage at which they molt into their juvenile coat, this is their baby coat, 
and then this is their juvenile coat. Which two of these animals are uh, represented here? And if you get a survivor to the next year, is it one of these animals or not? So that means you have to have a way to identify the animals easily and accurately in the field. So I'm going to tell you a little about some of the techniques I use. The first thing is to live trap the animals. So there's a lot of trapping of gophers goes on, but that's kill trapping or trapping with the intention of killing the animals. Uh, I use traps that are secure and they uh, are quite safe within the trap. Another important piece of information I have about the animals to, to know its sex. Is it a male or it's female? And I always like to pose this question to an audience and ask people, what do you think this particular individual is? What I typically discover is if I had an audience of more than one, who's my husband, and would be able to answer the question anyway, is how many people think this is a male? How many think it's a female? And I usually find about a third of the people think this is a female. About a third of the audience thinks it's a male. And the other third of the audience just does not want to convince, to commit themselves uh, to thinking that they could actually assign sex to this animal. So the answer to the question is, it's a male. Uh, it has testes descended into a blackened scrotum. And just keep that in mind, because we're going to come back and talk about male's testes in, in a, a short while. So this is a male Richardson's ground squirrel in the springtime. Now, identifying the animals in a way that we can identify them throughout their lifetimes, I've used uh, pierced earrings here that have a little number. So we're looking down on the head of the animal. This is the crown of the head, and here are the ears. And these earrings stay in for a lifetime. And so you can always recognize the animal by just checking what the number is that's uh, imprinted into the earring. But that's not very useful for observational purposes. If you want to sit back and observe the animals as they're doing things, you need to mark them in some way that's visible from a distance. And I did this by painting marks on the fur. Using mathematical symbols such as therefore, or letters of the alphabet, one or two, or numerals, or any imaginative pattern that I could think of. I found that Lady Clara Dye was very convenient to use, readily available in the drugstores, no doubt very much confusing drugstores, owners, uh, about um, where, what I was using this dye for, because my hair resolutely turned white and has continued to stay white. Here are some more dye mark ground squirrels that look very different. They've got wounds and injuries on their faces here. So what's the difference between these previous individuals that look so nice and sleek and undamaged and these ones here? Well, it is that they, the, the sex of the animals. If we locate them by sex, then the injured ones are always males, the ones with no damage are females. And it doesn't matter what time of year you check for this, it will only be the males that are, are damaged. So this made me realize that males and females must be behaving differently. If males are often wounded in one way or another, then they are doing something that females are not doing. And so that set me on the path of looking at sexual differences in the lives of Richardson's ground squirrels. So one important one is to look at the active season. When are they above ground and when are they in hibernation? And notice that this is a compressed scale. I've got March to October here, but I've dropped out the other four months of the year that would go through November, etc., until we get to the next season. So adult males, and I'm, all the dates that I will refer to here apply to the Chinook zone of southern Alberta. They'll be slightly later, uh, more to the east in the central parts of their range or going further north. The first animals out of hibernation are always the males, adult males, and they are sexually mature at one year of age, so as they come out of their first hibernation. About two weeks later, the adult females come out of hibernation. But they're only active for a relatively short period, and then they disappear from the active population and go back into hibernation. So mating occurs as soon as the females uh, come above ground. Females are then pregnant for 23 days. Uh, they lactate for about uh, four weeks, uh, a little over four weeks. After that's done, they can fatten up and get ready to go into hibernation. Males are the ones that get very damaged during the mating season. They need a recovery time. But as soon as they can get fat, they go back into hibernation. So in southern Alberta in the Chinook zone, 
Adult males are going into hibernation in late June, around the time of the summer solstice. And I'll say it again. Adult males into hibernation in late June. They will not come above ground for another eight months until we get to March of the subsequent year. And the same thing applies to the females, but it's just slightly different dates for the females. So among adults, the active season, when you will see them above ground, is about 110, maybe 120 days, depending on the year. Similar length for males and females, but males are the first to emerge and the first to go back underground. What about the offspring? Well, they're born underground, so we don't see them for their first month of life. So then, at this point, they come up. Uh, they have to grow, they're just juveniles, they're small, they've got to do all their growing, and then they've got to do preparation for winter. But what happens again differs here between females and males. The young females are ready to hibernate by late in August. The young males, their brothers, stay out for another two months and do not hibernate until October. So notice that here, this, there is a sex difference between the males and the females, but it's the females who disappear first and the males are last. Here, it was the males who disappear first. This is a remarkable calendar of who is active when. It's the most extreme example where the sons of these males up here, they go into hibernation four months later than their fathers do. So one of the consequences of, of, of what we're seeing here is that there's a long active season for the young males in order to grow and fatten. Uh, and so they go into hibernation last of all. The consequence of all of this is there's only about a six-week period in the year when all age and sex classes are above ground. So it's a short window of time. So once these animals go into hibernation, of course, they are secure from things such as poisoning and shooting and so forth. So this is an information that needs to be uh, uh, considered when people are taking action on dealing with ground squirrels. What else might differ between males and females? Well, males are much larger when they come out of hibernation than are the females. Males then initially start to gain weight, but then they experience a drop in weight. And so what reflects this drop in weight? Is that they can't find food in that stage of spring? Well, let's see what happens with the females. The females, on the other hand, have a trajectory of continuous increasing size, increasing in weight. So among adults, the males are larger at all times. Males are heavier, larger skeletally, and heavier by weight. But they experience a seasonal weight loss that we do not see in the females. The females, at the same time males are losing weight, are in fact gaining weight. And that is associated with the mating season. The males are losing weight during the mating season. Let's look at the juveniles. They come out of the natal burrow at about the same weight to each other, but pretty soon the young males are getting heavier than their sisters. The young females will go into hibernation uh, in August, but their brothers stay out for that extra two months. Why would there be such a difference between what young males and young females are doing in terms of how long they stay active and when they enter hibernation? Well, what you see here is this big difference Juvenile females do not complete their growth to adult size. They're nowhere near as big as their mothers. They'll finish their growth while they're pregnant next spring. So juvenile females spread their growth over two years, an initial amount in the, first, the year of birth, and then the remainder in the spring of their next year of life. Young males, on the other hand, complete growth to adult size. By staying out for those two extra months, they will become as large as their fathers were when their fathers went into hibernation. And again, we think about why is it more important for males to be big when they come out of hibernation next year than it is for females. So we have a big difference amongst the juveniles with males being larger and completing their growth to adult size within the first summer of life. Now let's talk about longevity. Is there a sex difference there? You'll notice that we have an almost perfect 50-50 uh, sex ratio here. It's the sort of result we don't want on Tuesday in the elections in the States. There's almost no difference between them. So I have followed over 8,000 young ground schools to determine how long they live, how many years they live for. And if you're following females, about one-third of them survive to the first year of life, in other words, to become adults, and about a half each year thereafter. 
So not many females survive to three and four years of age, and truly ancient ones would be five or six years old. What about the males? Story much more dramatic for the males. Only about 12% of males survive to adulthood, extremely high mortality in the first year of life. And then uh, only about a quarter of them survive for each subsequent year. The very oldest male I ever had out of these 4,000 odd was a single one who did just make it to be a four-year-old. But most males will only experience one breeding season. A few of them might experience two breeding seasons. So a remarkable difference in survival and longevity. So let's think of this now at the population level. If females have higher survival than males, then is there a sex ratio difference amongst the adults? Well, yes, there has to be. You'll notice that the populations fluctuate up and down, and so I've had years in which there was few as 30 animals in the area, and in the same area, years where there are as many as 300. So populations do go up and down, and yes, of course, that means that there are times where there are huge numbers of gophers in the fields. If we add the males to the picture, we see that the males follow the same trajectory of years of low numbers and high numbers, but they are always way less than the number of females. In fact, typically in the population, then, females outnumber males by a ratio of four to one. So, females are more numerous than males in the adult population because of differential survival. All females are impregnated. They all mate and will uh, have litters. So this means that polygyny, or multiple mating, sometimes pronounced polygyny, is a statistical certainty. A small number of males is inseminating the large number of females. If that's the case, why does it seem like males are fighting with each other, and this, we don't see this happening in females? Why are males fighting uh, in, when they seem to be in a land of plenty, of this surplus of females, four times as many females as males? Why are they injured? Well, partly it has to do with the fact that we're dealing with a very short mating season. This is that male that we looked at earlier. Uh, and he is uh, spermatogenic, in other words, he has testes producing sperm at this time. But males are only scrotal or producing sperm for about four weeks. It's a very short mating season uh, for, in terms of when females will be available to mate. And males' uh, testes then uh, shrink in size and return into an abdominal position. So males could only inseminate females for a few weeks of the year. What about the duration of the mating season from the female's point of view? Well, the way that I identify whether a female is in behavioral estrus is by the appearance of the vulva, if it's swollen or not. And it turns out that females are only in behavioral estrus, in other words, willing to mate with males, for about two hours on one afternoon of one day of the year. Once she mates, it'll be another year before she mates again. So there's a small window of time in which males need to find the females that are currently in behavioral estrus. So if we look at a single day in the pattern of animals coming out of hibernation, on this particular day, there were 51 females out of hibernation. All the males were out of hibernation. Here's our four to one sex ratio. We have about 13 males. Here's our four to one sex ratio with a surplus of females. But what's important is that only seven of these 51 females are in behavioral estrus. So amongst the 51 females, the males looking for mating opportunities have to find the seven that are in estrus. The consequence of this is that they fight vigorously for trying to find the estrus females. They wound each other badly. You get things like damage to the face, infection in the elbow here. This male has broken a uh, toe on one of his uh, 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 forelimbs. Fore so these males are in terrible condition. This is nature, uh, red in tooth and claw, to try for males to get access to females. Then, if he can keep the other males away, he's got to figure out which females are the ones that will mate today or in behavioral estrus today. So here's a young female just recently out of hibernation. She's not yet ready to mate, and she's trying to indicate that to the male. She's pushing her, pushing against him, splaying her claws here, fluffing up her tail. But a couple of days later, the picture is a little different. She is now uh, willing to accept the male as a mate. 
Usually the female goes underground and the male follows. Occasionally there are above-ground matings. And from that we can learn that sometimes females will accept uh, more than one male as a mate within that two-hour window of time. So the window of time is very short, but she may mate with a couple of males, in which case the litter will be multiply sired. So if we go back to this graph showing the population sex ratio between all the females out of hibernation and the males, and now add on down here which of those females are in estrus, what you see is there's no day in which there are more females available than males. In other words, there's always lots of males looking for the few females in estrus on any given day. And this means that mating season is extremely demanding on the males. So when we talk about reproductive effort, how much effort the individuals put in to becoming successful reproducers, there's a component choosing a good mate, mating effort, and there's a component of taking care of the offspring until they're uh, uh, able to be independent. For males, the cost of reproduction are high, physically in terms of damage and, uh, to their, their bodies and infections that they get, to the extent that some of them die. And this was a male that we observed just keel over and die the swelling in his head suggests that he's probably got lots of really bad infections from a result of bites and scratches. Here's a male at the end of the mating season. Pathetic, scrawny individual. He's got old, old wounds that are starting to dry out and heal up. Just capture that in your eye here and look at this is the very same individual now, several months later when he's ready to hibernate. So he's gone through the exhausting mating season which occurs when females come out of hibernation. He needs time to recover, replenish his body, and store fat. And then in June, late June, he'll go back into hibernation ready to try to do this all over again the next year. Females, of course, do have a cost of reproduction. They're the ones who get pregnant and produce the offspring. They then support them by milk. And so by the time that the litter is getting close to being ready to uh, become independent and leave the natal nest, uh, they collectively weigh more than the mother does herself. So here's a female with five of her young around here. And as you can see, the collective mass of her five babies is much greater than her own mass. Putting that on the graph, the mass of her neonates on the day they're born is very low, maybe only 50 or 60 grams. But the collective mass of the young when they wean here is around 500 grams or so. So the females are supporting this through eating and then turning essentially grass into milk, which they export to their young. That's certainly demanding in terms of the physiology of milk production, but it has no cost in terms of survival, and females do very well surviving through lactation. So we can now compare reproductive effort between males and females. Females make very little mating effort. They can just basically wait for males to appear. But females make a huge parenting effort, rearing a few young each year, and maybe in a lifetime producing one or two litters, rarely more than that. Males, on the other hand, make a huge mating effort, getting into fights. They're injured. They lose weight. Death is a high probability. A male could sire a lot of young in one year, but he's very unlikely to have a second year to do that again. And males expend no effort on being fathers. They probably don't even know who their offspring are. So gathering all of this information together on sex differences, then what we can say is that sex really matters for Richardson's ground squirrels. The males die young. They live a solitary life. We haven't talked about kinship. There's not time to cover that, really. But they're solitary. They uh, disperse from the natal group away from their uh, sisters and mother and so forth, so that prevents inbreeding. They live a high-risk, fast-paced life and put all their effort into mating as much as they can in that one year that they might be guaranteed of. Females, on the other hand, are longer lived. They form tight social bonds with each other. Mothers and daughters and grandmothers and aunts and nieces all form a very tight social system. They live a low-risk, slow-paced life and they put all their effort into being mothers, into parenting, uh, rather than into mating effort. So I'm hoping at this point that you learned a few things about ground schools, to, or gophers, if you prefer. But I do hope that you will recognize the name of these animals. And even if you choose to continue to call them gophers, 
please, at the back of your mind, always think about, well, I actually really know that they're Richardson's ground squirrels. Amaze your friends and stun your family by saying, oh, did you know that they're really ground squirrels uh, and that they're named after this famous Arctic explorer?